May I speak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our reading from Acts of the Apostles today makes the early church sound idyllic, doesn't it? The passage comes immediately after the apostles received the Holy Spirit in tongues of fire, and Peter had preached his sermon, causing three thousand people to be saved and join Christ's church. As groups they discuss, they share money, buildings, food, they pray together, they worship together. Well, if we read on, we find there were a few wrinkles. For example, the Hellenists, that is the Greek-speaking Jews, complained about the Hebrews, that is the Aramaic-speaking Jews, that their widows were not being cared for. But these problems were resolved amicably, and the church continued to grow. We know from history that it didn't stay that way. As Christianity spread throughout the world, politics and power struggles brought Christians against one another. People were burned and beheaded in the name of Christ. And still, today, despite valiant attempts by many, sections of Christ's church still argue over theological minutiae. It's all rather depressing, isn't it? Have we learned nothing over two thousand years? And yet the Spirit is still moving. We are still here. Acts is dominated by the Holy Spirit. It moves, it stirs, it causes individuals to do things they thought they weren't capable of, and it still does today. I'll come back to that later. This passage from Acts describes the early church as having four important aspects which are just as vital to a healthy church today as they were then. Firstly there's the Apostles teaching. This is the very foundation of our Christianity. If we do not grow our knowledge we are simply coming to church because we like the services, or we like the company, or we like the singing or the coffee and biscuits after the service. And our lives are still centered on the secular world and not on Christ. Secondly, there's the fellowship of those who believe. Luke, the author of Acts, describes the early Christians as all being together and having all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. And this is where we might say, ah, well, hang on a minute, I'm not so sure about that. But reading on, we find that they met in their own homes, which implies they still owned property and did, didn't live in one huge commune. Certainly, it would not have been practical for all 3,000 or more to live, eat and sleep together in one place. Imagine the logistics of feeding 3,000 people in one go. Oh, hang on, Jesus did that. But that's another matter. Later in Acts, we read how Barnabas, one of the followers, sold a field and gave the proceeds, so it seems that it was more a case of giving to others who were struggling than throwing all their possessions into one pot. And are we not called on to do this today? To sacrifice something of our own to help those in need? Without fellowship, it is difficult to sustain a living faith and people become isolated. In the present lockdown, this is a very real danger that we face, and it is only through modern technology that we are able to maintain our fellowship, as indeed we are doing at this moment. The third aspect is described as the breaking of bread. To us, this immediately brings to mind the Eucharist, but the breaking of bread was, and still is, an established custom among Jews. And it is important to remember that these early Christians were Jews and didn't suddenly stop being Jews. The term breaking bread is mentioned several times in the New Testament writings. You will remember from last week's Gospel reading that it was only when Jesus broke bread that the travellers on the road to Emmaus recognised him. The breaking of bread is something which is done in the context of a meal and refers to the blessing at the start of the meal. The one who says the blessing over the bread is referred to as the one who breaks bread and does so while literally breaking the bread. 
That said, to us, as modern day Christians, breaking bread does indeed symbolize the Last Supper and the ultimate sacrifice which Christ made that we might be saved. It is indeed a very important part of our Christian life and which one which I am sure you, like me, are missing very much at the moment. Without it, we are failing to fly the flag of Christ crucified and risen. Lastly, but certainly not least, there are the prayers. We are told they spent much time together in the temple. Again, we must bear in mind that for Jews the temple was God's presence on earth and that it is naturally the place they would go to pray and worship. If we're travelling with Jesus, we need to remember that prayer was a major part of his life. Consider how much time you give to prayer as an individual. Is it just something you do in church? Is it just a shopping list we pass up to God in the hope of getting something we want or we need? I had an interesting experience on Monday Thursday when I joined an online service led by Bishop Philip when clergy and readers renew their vows. At one time there was a point for individual prayer and sitting there at my computer I could hear through my headphones a complete incomprehensible jumble of the prayers of all those taking part and I thought to myself, is this what God hears all the time? Of course, it isn't, for God hears all our prayers individually and will respond as he knows is best for us. Our prayer should be a part of our daily lives which we set aside to talk with God and to listen to what he has to say to us. That listening to God is possibly the part of prayer people find the most difficult. I remember so many times sitting or kneeling in silence trying to hear what God had to say to me and all I ever got was my own conscience. But it isn't like that. God speaks to us in his own time and in his own way and calls us to do his bidding. Which brings me back nicely to what I said about the Holy Spirit causing individuals to do things they thought they weren't capable of. You see, today is Vocation Sunday, or to give it its proper title, the Day of Prayer for Vocations. It's not always obvious when God is calling you to do something. For Paul, on the road to Damascus, it was unmistakable. But it might just be a niggling that keeps popping into your mind, which you brush aside thinking, I haven't got time, or I'm not worthy, or I'm not capable. Think of those four things practiced by the early church. Teaching and, listen, teaching and learning. Is God calling you to learn more about the scriptures so that you may teach others, perhaps in church as a worship leader or reader, or to spread his word to the wider world? This fellowship, not easy at the moment, I know, but perhaps it needs you to become involved with church activities helping out at the coffee mornings, book sales, or maybe at the food bank. Maybe you have an idea for social get-togethers when we're let out again. Breaking of bread. Perhaps God is calling you for ordination. It's a big ask, but God wouldn't call you if he didn't know you can do it. And he'll send you the greatest helper of all, his Holy Spirit. And of course, there's prayer. The power of prayer cannot be underestimated. If you are unable to help Christ's church grow in any other way, you can always pray for others who are doing his work. And you know, we're always looking for people to lead into sessions in church. Maybe you can help. Think about it. Christ's church grew from his few followers to 3,000 in a few days and now is to be found throughout the whole planet. We are Christ's body here on earth and it is by practicing those good and generous things which the early church practiced that we will earn the goodwill of the people around us. 
and we will continue to grow that church. Is God calling you to be part of that? Amen.